Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Brown Bag uh, presentation. Um, Dr. Yoandi Cabrera is an assistant professor of Spanish and classics at Rockford University. His research areas include classical reception, mythology, queer theory, and Hispanic poetry and theater. The title of his doctoral dissertation is Rage and Desire, Thymotic Impulses in Hispanic Greece. He has taught Hispanic and classical courses in Cuba, Spain, and the United States. He's also been an instructor of Spanish, classical Greek, and classical reception at Texas A&M University. He's an alumnus of the American School of Classical Studies in Athens, where he was part of the AC, ASCSA summer section in 2018. One of his most recent publications is Vale Clásico y Tradición Greco-Latina in Cuba, in Cuba, Classical Ballet and Greco-Latin Tradition in Cuba, published by Aduana Vieja in 2019. He's the editor of our departmental journal, De Nos, which we invite you all to check out. Um, Dr. Cabrera has been appointed as a, the 2000, a 2021-22 visiting associate in Hellenic Studies at Harvard University's Center for Hellenic Studies. He also received a grant from the same institution for research expenses, a visit to the center during uh, this academic year and as support for developing classics at Rockford University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cabrera Ortega. Thank you, Dr. Loyola. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Sometimes I am talking too out loud and it's not necessary. <laughs> so I'm trying to have a moderate tone, right? Something like that. Well, thank you for being here with me here today. My idea is more sharing curiosities with you, stuff, things I found. Uh, in the archive during this summer and how it is connected to my teaching this semester and also how it is connected to future uh, articles, academic articles and also possible new volume about this topic. So this main reason why I went to check our archive and find information was because I wanted to see what we had from our former students, right, alumni, that was connected to classical reception and from different areas. But it was like, I, did, I never had time to do it. But one day, Dr. Loyola told me, come with me. It was this summer, by the way. Come with me. I want to show you something. Two sculptures. And I said, good, okay. I didn't expect, you know, great things. It was exactly in our building, right below where we are standing right now, <laughs> or in my case, sit it. <laughs> and she showed me two plaster casts of two marbles from the Parthenon, from the original, with the original size, etc. And I was really surprised. And I wanted to know more about it because not always, not every day, you find two Greek sculptures from the pediments of the Parthenon mm -hmm, and in your institution. It was like, how is it possible? I have seen in the past a lot of pictures from the art studio in our university from the 19th century and also 20th century. And I have never seen something like that. And I, then from there, I said, definitely I have to go to the archive now. And I began to check the archive, check the publications, mainly student publications, yearbooks, newspapers, uh, specific files from specific professors, mainly art professors and classics professors. And then I began to find so many information, so much information, but I didn't find anything. I, I, at first I didn't find anything about its cultures, right? So I kept going and from the, from the beginning, I saw that there were different lines of possible 
uh, future projects, right? And that's what I want to share with you. At least some of the some examples of what I have been checking there. I want to begin with this text. Well, this is the advertisement, and I love it. I want a printed copy in in color for me to have it to have it in my house. So I I added this here because I love it. It is really nice. You know the color and the way. This Medusa is like interacting with our dear Jane Adams, right? The connection with Medusa, femininity, female figure, and her Cassandra, right? That is the topic of her uh, page that she finished studying here in 1881. So, but I want to begin before the, I show you this. With a student of mine who is taking my Classics 262 class this semester, where we are talking about the connection between politics, the archive of Rockford University, mythology, mainly three main characters, Antigone, Cassandra, and um, I forgot one, Oedipus, mm -hmm. and how is it connected to mythology and how we're working with the archive and also using the archive uh, as part of one of our uh, class exercise that is going to be a, a representation of a Mexican Antigua. So with me, is he, um, Sophia, uh, one of our students right now, she's studying elementary education and she's taking right now with us History of Rome and Classics 262. Uh, the name of this class is Staging Politics in Antiquity and Today. So I asked Sophia to read one of the texts I found mm -hmm, uh, in the archive. And you will see why and what is the connection here. So this is Sophia and she's right here with me. Yeah. So, um, this is Ubi Sunt from the archive. There are the footsteps that once re echoed along narrow corridors, patterned with light through the thoughtful silence of the library. Where are the feet that wore small ballo ballos on the steps in the linden and middle that raced across the hockey field in the crisp days of autumn? Where are the voices, fresh and young like ours, singing in the court, oh, Rockford College and Decus, reciting the class, laughing and shouting in all these our rooms? Where are the faces, now solemn, now joyful, which glimpsed through partly open doors, peopled the classrooms, and crowded into chapel? Where are the hands, which once labored with care on a dress, mixed paints on a palette, coaxed a tune from a piano? Where are the girls whose ghosts throng the gym, brush past you in a dimly lighted coals? Unconscious influence on our lives and thoughts and hearts. And where in you to come who someday will act the same of us. Okay, so I also want Sophia to explain from her perspective what we are doing in this class. So in Classics 262, we started out by reading Ubi Sunt, and it's we're talking about things that we've read in the archive and how it relates to Greek mythology. And right now we talked about Oedipus and Antigone, and we're now doing a play on the Mexican version of Antigone. And um, later in the semester, we're going to be reading Cassandra. And we're gonna see how like, what we read in the archive relates back to Greek mythology. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Sophia. Yeah, I wanted to have someone from, uh, the class, right? And she volunteered. So I'm really happy to have her with us here. So um, before I uh, show this, you could see two of the main and most important professors of classics at Rutherford University, Dr. Mary Victoria Braggington and Dr. Raymond Denaville. Mm -hmm. Give me a second. 
<laughs> okay, so I have them here with us because they are one of the two most important scholars in classics at Rutherford University. Uh, Mary Braggington was with us like 40 years teaching and also in different administration uh, positions. And also um, Raymond Denadel was like with us like 40 years as well. So they are like two big representations during the 20th century of our professors, classics professors here. And many of the uh, topics and examples I'm gonna show were, uh, were like encouraged by them here. So this text is called Ubisun, the text re read by Sophia. Well, Ubisun is a biblical motif, by the way, not only classical, but all, also biblical motif, meaning where are they? Mm -hmm. So the idea here is that you're asking about those who live in the past, but at the same time, see how this student whose name was Phyllis Cecil, right? Says at the end, and where in years to come are the students who someday will ask the same of us. My idea having Sophia here reading with me was like having a student from Rockford University right now reading this is really powerful because this is from the beginning of the 20th century. And it's like a continuation. And that is the way I understood and I can mm, like explain the classical reception at Rockford University. A continue and ongoing conversation from the 19th century until today. Um, so I think that this text was really interesting and I wanted to share this text with you. Well, this is a fontaine, by the way, we're gonna talk about poetry now, but this is a fontaine from the all campus where you have the, uh, well, an antecedent of our mermaid mm -hmm, in Burpee, mm -hmm. well, where she was before. If this is not exactly the one we have restored, but Kelly, but Kelly who is here by the way with us, uh, if this is not the one, it's a similar one because there was at least two, I think. So, well, when we talk about poetry and I, I I was thinking about different ways to organize the information. And the way I did was by gender, by genre, right? Not gender, by genre. Uh, so literary genre, but artistic as well. So we begin with poetry. Um, well, this example here is from the last uh, issue of the of fingerprints, right? And it is a part of one uh, project we began in this advanced translation class mm -hmm, with different Cuban authors and the translators are students from our class. And we published these two uh, poems, for example, who are connected to uh, some mythological characters. The first one is about Ajax, one important warrior in the Iliad who ended up committing suicide and the second one talk about eros mm -hmm. and the connection with erotis, meaning question in, in Greek. So eros means love, of course, but ero, erotao is to ask, to, to question, to ask questions. So then from before, we have, for example, this poem uh, from the beginning of the 20th century this point about Oedipus. This is the poems. These are some of the poems I began to use in my class to introduce, for example, Antigone and Oedipus. Antigone is the daughter of Oedipus. So how are they connected? And my main point here with the class was showing our students how these mythological characters were represented and understood and uh, interpreted, right? by different former students of our institution. And from there, we had conversations about uh, the meaning the, of the myth, et cetera. 
in this specific case, Antigone by Derberg by Combs, mm -hmm. well, we realize the connection, and this is really interesting to me, the connection between the way Antigone is represented here and how it is represented in the Mexican Antigone we are staging this semester. Because the play we are staging begins saying, I didn't want to be an Antigone, but it happened to me. Mm -hmm. So see in this last part of the poem, how the author taking, using the voice of Antigone, talking from I, right from the first person says, um, if I am to be a son, I be forgotten. A few blank years will bury my death and all will be the same as it was before. But I have no more to die for that thin son and I have no more to live in that this fear. I would not be Antigone, the creature of this tax ungrateful, but Antigone I am and there is no one else who I might be. That kind of connection between this fatum, right, this fortune, this kind of destiny, and the Mexican Antigone we are representing, I think that is really interesting because our Antigone from Rutherford University, this one, is from the beginning of the 20th century. So one century later, a Mexican poet called Sara Uribe is saying something similar. I didn't want to be an Antigone, but it happened to me. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the examples. Uh, there are much more poems, a lot of them. We can have only about poems and classical reception at Rafa University, we can have a, a volume, only about it, okay? But then about articles and essays, uh -huh, and see, well, this is one of the, the, the folders uh, from the Rockford University archive. Uh, and before I continue, I would say thank you very much to uh, everybody in our library. We have a wonderful group of people working there. And I really feel uh, fortunate and happy because everything I needed, even sharing everything I found Every moment I found a new play, a new picture, something I couldn't find. They were really patient, listening to me <laughs> and sharing with me some ideas. And some of them helped me to find more information. So I'm really happy uh, because I think we have a wonderful group uh, in, our in our library and I'm, I'm, I'm really thankful. So here, the first text I have it's from 1884, and it is also by Jane Adams. I say also because I mentioned already Cassandra. Cassandra is going to be published this same year, 1881. Let me check anyway, because I have the information here. No, yeah, but I think, yeah, it was published the, the same year. I don't have the information right there, but I remember that. So this text, by Jane Adams mm -hmm, is about the discovery of Troy that happened like some years before she wrote this. So it is really amazing how Jane Adams is talking about this uh, topic, right? And also connecting to human behavior, human feelings, um, Emotions, human emotions. And the connection is as follows. Uh, the, when Troy was discovered, they found, the archaeologists found more than one Troy, of course. Troy from different periods. Every time Troy was destroyed, they rebuilt the city. So there were different levels of Troys. And at least they found between 10 and 12. So the information Jane Adams had at that moment, the different levels that were known at that moment are used by her to talk about human situation and human condition during the existence in general, right? So it is amazing how, 
And I am, of course, using an iconic example, Jane Addams, but it's not, you know, it's not uh, an example that is like only one among uh, the many I could find. This is the, nor the norm. This is what you normally find. Students from Rockford University writing essays, but in a very free and artistic way. It is connecting different possible interpretations or solutions. This is about Troy and the human condition. But then you have her article about Cassandra, the same year in 1881, where she is talking about Cassandra as the representation of what women should keep doing. That is trying to say her truth. And by the way, what she is like defending and arguing in that mm, text, Cassandra, um, is mainly that there is an empiric uh, con knowledge, an empiric uh, uh, way of thinking that is feminine in general. She's, it, she marked that kind of knowledge as feminine and it should be used more often. That is in general what she is saying. Uh, using that feminine impulse to try to understand the world and try to fix what is wrong, something like that. And understanding that Cassandra was cursed by Apollo and she was not understood when she talked, but she kept trying. And it is like, what she's trying to say is, well, they may not hear, listen to us at first, but we should keep talking. They may not um, understand what we're saying, but we should be trying, right? And I was checking my notes to find specifically, uh -huh, it's instinctive way of thinking. Mm -hmm. She is comparing that way of thinking to that who is that, to that thinking that is more scientific, right? And she is like um, underlining and saying how important that kind of instinctive thinking is to understand human condition and to try to uh, like fix some social problems. Um, I don't have a picture here of the of her article, but I may say that we published that article online in our online version of our journal, uh, departmental uh, journal. Uh, let me see if I can show you where it is. It is right here. Cassandra by Jane Adams. So of course I asked our uh, people from the library permission to publish this, absolutely. Uh, so here is the, the text, right? So it's, it's already published online and I think it's a good idea to have something like this. At the same time, this article is together with, for example, an article by other of our students about the Latin American Antigones, right? The relationship between Greek mythology and Latin America today. So see how uh, Antigone, Cassandra, from Jane Adams until uh, Alisa Giardono, one of our students, right? Well, it's, it's a topic that we have uh, among our research uh, papers, even from our own students, right? Um, let me go back to the presentation. And I think I, I would try to finish as soon as I can, by the way. Uh, but I want to show you mainly pictures. I, I thought that this was also a good moment just to share with you images, poems, read some of them, look at some of them, because we always, when we have more formal and academic presentations, we never, we don't have time to read poems, right? We don't have, we don't have time to read the text we are analyzing and it's like crazy, right? So, well, this is another text from the same period, right? 1883, 
uh, who is an Oedipus. And it's the same. This is not by Jane Addams, for example, but the same, the, it's the same process. It's like using Oedipus to understand our behavior today and do, uh, making connections, right? Um, and also, this is really interesting. You will find in our archive, in many of the pub student publication and also faculty publications, topics about uh, education in general connected to examples from the classical tradition. And this is an example, right? Education or training. And this is, by the way, an important topic right now in our university because we continue talking about what liberal arts are and what should be doing with liberal arts education. So it is part, and this is from the beginning of the 20th century. And this by one student, Dorothy White. So then here we have another text by Jane Addams. By the way, I am not sure if this one is published. I am almost sure that the Schlemish one, when I say published, I mean in new modern compilations, right? I am almost sure that the Schlemans about the, the Trojan topic, right? The, her paper about Troy and Schliemann, the, the guy, I mean, the, the German uh, scholar who found a Troy, I am almost sure that is not part of the modern compilations of her works. Mm -hmm. Maybe Judith Hallett has more information about it than me. Judith, you wanna add something? Before you talk, I wanna thank you because you were so kind to send me this morning your article. I, I would love to finish reading it as soon as possible. I began this morning, but I don't know if you had information about this text before. Um, I unmuted it. Well, yes, I, we, could, we don't hear you that well, though. Yeah, we couldn't hear you. You're unmuted, but it, your voice came through a little. Yeah, I think I think you're. Can you hear me? The connection is not okay. working very well. I think. Let's try again here. Oh, that's good. Um, no, no, no. Yeah, you perfect. should be able no, to perfect. hear me. Mm -hmm. Now, now we, now can, hear we can hear you. Yes. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. Let me. I'm. I'm on the phone, so I'm not gonna. Oh, I'm. Are you? You can. Okay, then that's better. I'm doing this on an iPhone. <laughs> I've been making. You would send me this material. I can. My big interest in Jane Adams and Hull House. Uh, and my grandmother, who was an immigrant from Belarus as a young teenage girl, learned English at Hull House. And Hull House was this incredible, incredible vehicle for Americanization of different immigrants with very, very different agendas. Um, I first became fascinated with the curriculum at Hull House because they offered Latin <laughs> and Greek. And there were people there, college graduates, it's all co-educational, which is another amazing feature of, of Hull House because most women's education at that point was sexually segregated. But they were offering Latin and Greek, mostly to young men who wanted to go get high school degrees and you know college professional training and she in Greek people who perform Greek plays in the original. Um, she recognized the diversity of American opportunities and the diversity among uh, different kinds of immigrants, and she embraced it all. And uh, this is one of the things that I, is so extraordinary about your project, because you're integrating this, ma you know, major, um, shall we call it an immigrant um, strand of Hispanic culture here in the U.S. into Rockford, folks. Um, I've done a lot of work on women and classics in the 1880s since I did the Jane Addams and Hull House uh, piece. And one place I really would urge 
urge you to connect with it can't be that far away is wash you in st louis how far are you from there about five hours yeah five hours yeah mm -hmm. can you hear me yes, yeah it's right. a little bit choppy that's all um, because they had women students and were putting on. Yeah, so in 1884, Rockford, uh, you no, know, five hours, five hours from Rockford, Wash U put on an all female production in Latin of a play by Plautus, and they rewrote the script to take out the sex and focus on slavery and emancipation from slavery. And this was a very courageous thing to do because of course it was, you know, 20 years, not even that after the civil war, uh, in the audience written union symbols and these motivated by their intuition, right? to do what was right. Now, whether they knew about Jane Addams remains to be seen, but there's this whole, uh, you know, impetus from women um who worked with jane adams and worked on the same you know studies that she did to bring a more humane and inclusive vision uh to the field so i think there's lots of interesting material from the yeah. 1880s from the east coast where it's all pretty much sex segregated the further west you go the more you're going to find women and men, you know, studying together. Oberlin is the obvious example because that's an interesting um, classics program because they had blacks and black women uh, in uh, their whole program of studies, as well as you know, white people of both genders. So again, Jane is part of a really important um, element and. Um, energy uh and what's going on not only in feminism but american higher education american cultural identity and so i was so happy to see you were talking about her at rockford because there's so much work that still needs to be done it sounds like you've gotten started well thank you again for all the information i know something about the feminine movement in san luis because i attended online one seminary or like a short conference about it last semester, and it was really interesting. This article uh, on the screen right now is not by Jen Adams, I was wrong. This one is by one professor who wrote to her students, mm -hmm. female students during the 19th century, right? Um, about her journey, her trip around many different places of Italy. One of them, for example, is the tomb of Virgil. I know that Stefan is going to be interested in this. So uh, then, well, see an example very quickly about this discussion. This is from the 19th century. This is from the end of the 19th century. They are discussing if classical studies are important or not if we, we should keep them or not. So it's a long and very odd discussion. So just to let you know that in, there is a long editorial, for example, of the Rockford Feminine Magazine, only about classical studies, what we should do with them or something like that. How are they useful? So, and here I have some examples, really interesting examples an article by one of the students talking about a comparison between Athens and Boston. Amazing. And the other one, this one, this one the first one is uh, from the 19th century. The other one is from the beginning of the 20th century. It's a comparison of Greek and Anglo-Saxon women. But then, for example, I remember a very interesting one about the roads, the system of so many roads a comparison between Peru and Rome, <laughs> for example. So then, uh, well, another example. This is the article by Jane Adams about um, the Trojan War and, and Troy. 
So the one I mentioned before by hair is, no, I don't think I, I didn't, I know it wasn't. I talk about it, but I didn't find it. I, it is not here uh, already. So this one is by about Troy. And this one is about Schliemann, the one I already mentioned. Uh, and this is the second one by Jane Adams. Mm -hmm. That I didn't find. See that is signed by her with her whole name mm -hmm, and her year of uh, graduation because at this moment she's not anymore a student of Rutgers University. This one was published in 1886, I think. I can verify this right away. Yes, January 1886. The previous one by about Troy and Schliemann, mm -hmm. this one, right? Is, see the signature, right? It's JA81 because she was part of the staff of the publication. So she didn't write her whole name. It was not necessary. And then very quickly about theater plays and events. Well, see that this is a play now, by the way, we studied in our class this semester uh, about the fall of Troy. This one helped me to talk about Cassandra as a feminine um, character connected to Cassandra, the paper by Jane Adams, and also connected to uh, Mother Cassandra we are gonna read in our class by a Franco-Uruguayan author. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were talking in our class about the different connections between human trafficking, feminine uh, issues, uh, gender topics, right? Connecting Jane Adams, the mother version, and this uh, version about the fall of Troy, right? How Cassandra is not heard or understood here, among other feminine characters such as Hecuba, the queen of Troy. Uh, well, some images of the uh, classical club. In this specific um, issue, this one is from the uh, Gear books during the 20th century. In this specific issue, they are talking about uh, a general description of what has been the classical club since it was founded in 1893. Then they talk about um, a stage during 1896, a, a representation of Medea by Euripides. They then mention on January 12, 1913, members of the club gave a Roman banquet. This was a very common and yearly celebration on campus, having a Roman banquet. People talked only in English and food was supposedly Roman. Uh, I said English, no, I meant Latin. <laughs> they talk only in Latin. So another example of the classical club, in this case, they are talking about a play, a Roman school. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, uh, the player talks by Miss Bryanton and Miss Potts. So this is a play, and this is not the only one. There is another one, at least a second one. This is a play written by students about a classical topic where the classics professor are characters. So I think it's hilarious. And it's, you know, a connection between very serious and formal topics from the classical reception and a kind of, you know, student parody of those topics they were studying, right? This is from the 1930 year book. This is a play represented by the, the same uh, classical club, right? And this is the Captives by Plautus, right? Translated by one of our professor of classics. Well, this is something that we can read in the 1914 year book where uh, it is said that Miss Margaret C. Waits uh, 
uh, organized the, cap the Capkiwi by Plautus, right, to be represented, just exactly what we read. And more information about the club activities. This is a representation of mm, the Oresteia, in this case, specifically Electra. Well, uh, well, no, Oresteia was represented before. This is Electra by, I guess, by Sophocles. So uh, let me see another example here. Well, this is really interesting because May party was a celebration. I don't know when it finished. Uh, maybe when we had our new campus or when we changed and we had both male and female students, maybe. But the thing is that the May party celebration was uh, where we had one of the students crowned of the May queen. And it was the beginning of the celebration of the beginning of uh, the spring, right? So the interesting thing here in this uh, article or brief note is that they are talking about the May party and the May Queen of Rockford University, but connected to the Orpheus and Eurydice mythological uh, history. Uh, something more, well, the classical club here having one of their banquets, right? And it's interesting this, uh, uh, parody of the beginning of the Enaid. The beginning of the Enaid says, Arma Virunque Cano. They have a mistake here. They're using the wrong um, case in Latin, but let's go to the important part, right? You know, me, the Latin professor with Stephanie correcting the students, right? But forget about it, but see. The beginning of the NA says, Arma Virunque Cano. Mm -hmm. I think of the men and uh, the weapons, right? So they are saying, I think about books and women. It's amazing. So instead of men, they are talking about women in Florida. Instead of weapons, they are talking about books. So that kind of parody is really interesting here. So just to show you that there are some examples here that break the idea of classical reception or, or classical tradition as a very serious, you know, feel or whatever. The way, the most I love about how our students have been taking this kind of heritage is like appropriating it and doing, and doing it in a very free and sometimes parodic way, right? So here we have another representation. In this case, Trojan women by Euripides uh, in the middle of the 20th century. So we have seen different representation from different periods. And then, well, these are pictures of Dido and Aeneas, another representation. Um, and then we have some example of a sculpture and painting. I know because Chris told me and I will ask him to send me some images. I know that we continue having our students painting portraits uh -huh, and also different drawings, right? Uh, having us like their, uh, having us their example or what they have to draw is like a Greek bust. And I saw that this is a really interesting representation of the you know funny and uh, on informal or familiar way to interact with this bust they were using to do their uh, art assignments, right? So you have a bust here and then one guy, this is the picture. If I am not wrong, this is the picture of the graduation. <laughs> so you have these three guys and you see the, he, there are three names right here. Right, but they are in good company. I think that this is Hadrian, if I am not wrong. This is another, um, uh, maybe another Roman emperor. Is Roman the portrait? But I am not completely sure. And then, well, another 
nice images from the art studio from different periods. This one, see this head of the horse? See how many, this boost, we, we still have this one. We have lost many of them, but at least we have Homer. This one is Homer. And I think that we have this one as well. Uh, in, in, in our art studio in the Clark Art Center. So more pictures, see for example, a painting by one of the students of the bust of Homer, right? This one here, now paint, no, it's, it's a drawing, right? Uh, so then, well, they are working here and then you have these discophoros, not the discophoros because the discophoros, the discophoros is throwing the, the disc, right? In this case, it's the discophoros, the one who is carrying the discos, right? So, and the students of art working on their uh, paintings, right? And drawings. And again, students using, now it's even further. Uh, I mean, be, they're going beyond any limit. They're using non picture of themselves, but pictures of the sculptures, but their names are there. So instead of using their honest picture, they're using picture of the sculptures in the yearbook of their, the, during the year of their graduation. And well, these are the sculptures we have in the basement of uh, Scarborough. And Dr. Uh, Rivera, I'm gonna give you one more minute because we have just a couple of minutes left. <laughs> yeah, I think that in two minutes I can finish. So uh, with this, I can finish because this is, exactly where we are right now. Our dean, my department, and the art department are looking for ways, right? And different uh, alternatives and possibilities to find a better, play, a better place to display these two sculptures. I would finish, I will show you other pictures, but I will finish saying that I tried to find information about these sculptures in our archive. It was really difficult. Uh, Dr. Wicks Baxter helped me a lot, connecting with other former professors, for example. And that way I could find a connection with the Art Institute. It was Adrienne, uh, her name is Adrienne Kaufman, the one who created the tiles in, in Star Building, the science building, that uh, artist was the one in charge of the donation from the Art Institute of these uh, plaster casts. And it took place in 1946. So now I have letters from our archive and letter from the Art Institute archive and uh, an exhaustive list of all the donations some of them, not many, some of them are in our art studio today. And these two are two pieces that have been in this basement for a lot of years, maybe more than 30, maybe, maybe more than 30. We wanna change that. And that would be a great achievement for this project, by the way. Another picture of this, another one another picture of these two sculptures. And this is a uh, painting by one of the students of our students representing Helen of Troy. And this is very quickly, and just an example of uh, caricatures, right? Uh, drawings, right? Uh, representing in a very funny and informal way, representing the different sections of these new uh, magazine, Recensio, with a Latin name. And this is the note, mm -hmm, the editorial or the first number explaining the Latin origin of the word. Just to, for you to see mm -hmm, these very funny uh, uh, drawings, introducing every section of the mm, uh, new magazine, uh, new magazine at that moment, right? and see the faculty. I didn't know that they knew I would 
each here in the future. That's me, by the way. <laughs> so, and this is the pandemic Medusa, right? The last cover of our magazine, Finger Fingerprints. So yeah, from Jane Adams, right? From Troy, represented and analyzed by Jane Adams to this pandemic Medusa. We have survived and we'll keep doing it. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Cabrera, for your presentation. I know normally we allow for uh, Q&A. It uh, is wonderful, wonderful to see this exploration of research um, and your engagement with the library and archives and history. I invite all of you to um, ask uh, Dr. Cabrera questions directly over email. I can stay on um, about 10 more minutes, but I know Dr. Cabrera, I think, may have class to go to. Is that right? Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, but thank you. Until, until 1 p.m., we can have some questions. Yeah. Wonderful. I'm going to go ahead and, and turn off the recording in a second. I do want to invite everyone to our next Jane Adams related brown bag presentation this semester, which will take place on November 8th at 12 p.m. Lynette Great, Senior Lecturer of Writing at Central Kansas University and our Jane Adams Center Visiting Scholar will present a talk on Jane Adams coming to voice at Rockford Female Seminary. We invite you all to join that presentation as well. Thank you all for joining us today. <laughs>